Okay, we are now online. Hello, everyone. This is Sarah from Unleash Today. I see people are joining. Hello, Julia, another person. <laughs> and hello, Sarah. So nice to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really thrilled to be here with you all. Perfect. Let's just wait a few seconds until more people are joining. Sure. It's very early in the morning after all. <laughs> it is very early in the morning for me, so I, will ha I have to have a cup of coffee this morning. Um, so I Even though it's late, me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Coffee's good at all times of the day, right? Exactly. <laughs> Although here in China, of course, it's more the green tea that is very popular. <laughs> mm. I do love a good green tea. That's um, delicious. Um, this morning I was running a little late, um, so coffee is where I'm at this morning. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've come to, I've really come to a lot of green tea since I'm here. Um, mm -hmm. It's even much, it's more, much better than uh, at home. So mm -hmm. um, if you ever come visit, I would, uh, I would take you to a tea house. <laughs> so Sarah, you have now opened the door and I will be there to visit because I have <laughs> love to come and see what that's uh, come to uh beijing to see i i love to travel it's one of my favorite things to do and like we don't have a, a big house or you know lots of things because i love to go and travel that's what i want to do like i like to go and see and experience and learn and so it's yeah. fantastic uh, traveling really opens your horizon broadens your horizon and um, opens your eyes it's very true let's hope that uh COVID will end soon and we will all be freer to, to move around. Oh, now, yeah. I see two more people have joined in the meantime. Hello, hello Kate, hello Uyen. Thanks for waking up so early in case you're in the US. <laughs> <laughs> now perhaps we wait another minute and then we will get started. Yes. Usually, I you have to wait at least five minutes before everybody gets. Now, have you traveled a lot in the last years? Have you been able to leave leave your town and your your state? Um. So I have. Let me think about this. We. We travel a lot within the state, so we have the mountains. So I live in Charlotte, North Carolina, which we may repeat here in a minute, but I, I do live in Charlotte. So we have the mountains and the beach very close to us within a couple hours drive. And so we do a lot of travel within, and then we're very close to actually South Carolina and Virginia. So mm. we do a lot of that. And then the last really big trip I took, we went to San Francisco um, about a year ago, and uh, we had some other things planned. Uh, you know, but COVID has interrupted much of that. So right now, uh, we are planning to go to Las Vegas area at the end of the year I, um, for a conference and an award that I'm going to be receiving. So my whole family is going to go. And I think we're going to try to do the Grand Canyon and a couple other things. So. Wow. You got an award. This is something I discussed with you in just a second. Now oh. you uh, brought me on something. <laughs> But I, it's true, I guess if you're from a, a, such a big country as you are from, it, there's actually no need to, to cross uh, the Atlantic to, to travel to another continent because you have, you have such a vast country with so many different uh, countrysides well, and landscapes. <laughs> there are a lot of really amazing things to do in, in the United States. The, um, I do love to travel abroad. Actually, I have a very warm place in my heart for London. I studied abroad there and have wanted to go back since I left. And, but in the midst of all of our travel, having children, children changed some of that. So um, it's a little bit of a different ball game when you're carrying two little people. Um, and so now uh, they're a little bit older so we can start doing some bigger travel. So I really want to take that. We've talked a lot about they're very interested in going abroad and um, we watch this car show. My son does. He's very obsessed with it. And supercharged cars, I think is what it's called. And um, they're in London. He's like, I want to go visit. I'm like, yes. 
Wow, another reason then. Yeah. Perfect. Now, should we get started, Sharon, given that it's five past, I see another person has joined. Hello, Elizabeth. So, hello, everyone. I'm Sarah. I'm speaking to you from Beijing, and I'm the co-author of Unleash Today. And I'm very excited to be here today, joined by Dr. Sharon Torrance-Jones. I hope I pronounced this correctly. Yes. And we will speak about confidence building with passion. And I couldn't be more happy to have her on board as she's really um, an extremely passionate and confident person. And I'm excited for her to, to share her experience and her knowledge with us. Now, Sharon, before um, introducing you in just a second, allow me to introduce myself very quickly and I'm here today. Um, so I'm, as I said, one of the co-authors of Unleash Today, together with Kate Surala. And we are two, let's say, bold millennials that climbed up the corporate ladder very quickly. And we faced lots of challenges on the way. And last year, the two of us got together and said, you know what, we want to share this experience. We want to share our lessons learned so we can help all of the young, ambitious women out there to maximize their potential in the workspace. Now, we are very excited to have a team of now 13 people, as well as around uh, 50 international experts around the world that support us in that endeavor of publishing our first book um, in November. So if you want to learn more about confidence building and overcoming perfectionism and how to network well, also virtually now during COVID, of course, then do make sure to subscribe to our website and our different social media channels. So, so you will uh, be updated once the book is out. Now, um, very quickly to the people on the, uh, on the line, we want to make this very interactive. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to write something down, to ask your questions. So um, this is interactive as we don't really have a set agenda and want, of course, give you the opportunity to, to raise um, comments and questions you might have. Now to you, Sharon, if I may say so. Um, if I describe you, I was thinking beforehand how, how I would start. And I was thinking, you know what? She is a positive minded, motivated, out of the box thinker. This is really the first thought I had after having spoken to you. So I'm super excited that you are here today and share your kind of personal experience on how you develop this kind of strong confidence and, and passion that you, I personally think, display very much. Now, who is, uh, who is Dr. Sharon Terrence Jones? She's the founder and CEO of DDOT and Dottie Rose Foundation, as well as the founder of the Lady Tech Climbers podcast. Um, so you already heard the term tech because Sharon is extremely passionate about technology on the one hand and education on the other hand. And I find this is a combination we unfortunately don't see enough among, among women nowadays. And I'd love to discuss with you in a second why this is the case and how we could perhaps change that. So in, in practice, Sharon really offers different technology-focused education workshops. And what is very special, I find, is that you really try to kind of combine this um, concept, this technical concept of technology with more like um, different forms, such as art, design, academic writing, um, which I guess makes it also more attractive to, to girls in particular. And your passion is really to make technology accessible to everyone and make it more diverse and thereby empower everyone with technology. And as you just said, you have been uh, awarded and continue to be awarded for your endeavors. And hence, I would be very excited to hear more about your background. So Sharon, over to you, perhaps you, um, if you don't mind, quickly introduce yourself also with your own words. Perhaps there's something I probably forgot. <laughs> you did a wonderful job. And thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for that wonderful intro and um, the opportunity to be here with you and to collaborate. Um, this has been such a wonderful collaboration that Sarah and I have been able to have several conversations. And every time I talk to Sarah, I get excited, um, just a warm heart. And so thank you so much. As she said, my name is Sharon. And um, yes, I have been in education for 20 years, almost 20 years. And my focus has been computer science. Um, I am a smidge older than Miss Sarah and Katie, Kate. And um, 
And so I'm right on the edge of that millennial Gen X uh, uh, group of individuals. But I say that because when I have started my educational journey, most of, of what I have learned in technology has all been self-taught because growing up, I didn't have a lot of access to computers and all the different elements around uh, technology. And so I've self-taught myself most everything I know, which is part of the reason why it's become such a passion to find the, the similarities between what you're learning in technology and everyday actions. But yeah, I have been, I've taught high school and then um, had the opportunity to uh, teach at our community college here, which would be uh, equivalent to, well, I'm thinking secondary education there in the UK or in Beijing. I'm not exactly sure how that falls, but there, our community college is a two-year degree um, here in the States. And then, um, yeah, just kind of as an organic situation, I ended up being able to open up my own businesses. And then the nonprofit, the Dottie Rose Foundation, is named in honor of my grandmother, who um, is and was and is uh, an inspiration in my life. She uh, always believed in continued education, but the part about my grandmother that was that I didn't put all the pieces together until even after starting this foundation. But my grandmother um, grew up here in Charlotte, North Carolina, but she didn't have the opportunity to go to college. It wasn't encouraged for women at that time to go and extend your education. But what my mama D did was she continually took education courses. So she was always taking a class or working on a certificate or doing different things to continue to move her skill sets forward. Um, and a lot of those skill sets were around her passions. And so I find my, found myself falling into her uh, footsteps or into her shadow doing different things with her because, and that's, that's the essence of what our, the nonprofit is about, is about finding your skill set, finding your genius and using tech for a positive and helping girls navigate this very uh, strange uh, discipline that is tech that has uh, really been dominated by men. Now, when did you then realize that technology and education are your big passions? Is this something you realized at a later stage or did you know very early already when you yourself were in, in high school or university? Oh, no. No way, Jose. So I, um, in high school, I struggled a lot trying to figure out what exactly it is that I wanted to do. Like I, I was very academic and liked to learn. Um, I've told this story before, but um, I really enjoyed theater very much, but I found myself really enjoying radio. And so I made my own little radio show in my bedroom and I was DJ Sharky Sharon um, for uh, the better part of my high school career, just in my, you know, just, I would uh, create mixtapes. So at the time, mixtapes with a cassette deck were very popular and I would do the ramp up as a DJ. This is DJ Sharky Sharon coming to you in the midnight <laughs> hour. And I would, you know, use my, um, uh, my math, like the math skills of like timing the ramp up. And then like when the DJ on the radio would stop and I'd start recording, there was a you know, whole piece to that. So I really thought actually that communications was where I was really going to go. Um, I come from a very, very long line of educators and I kind of fought that thinking that was not what I was going to do. So no, I did not discover really my passion in terms of technology until I was working on my master's degree. And I found myself really, I decided to do in, in education. The other thing about this is when you, when you decide to do education, you do elementary, you can do middle or you can do high school. And if you do high school, you specialize in English, math, science, social studies. Well, that really wasn't me in any capacity. I just yabbered all the time, right? And so business and information technology really ended up being where I thought the right fit was going to be. And so I went to a university that focused on technology, thank goodness. And, and at the time was very innovative. I went to East Carolina University for my master's and they were one of the first to put out distance learning. Um, this was back in the day when you had your big webcam that set up on the top of your computer <laughs> and it would, ee, 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 you know, you still dialed in and it would sometimes work and not work. Um, 
And that's where I really began my passion. I made my first web page on five floppy disks and a pop them in to figure out, you know, each page and upload it. But like, there was something really invigorating about being able to tell the computer and learn how to work with a computer instead of being scared of it. I think that was, you know, really the big piece for me because when we were younger, you know, if you messed up, the, you did something in the computer and something went wrong, you, you know, it was like, oh my God, you know, I've broken the entire world. You were scared to do anything wrong. Um, especially because the device was so big and complicated. And so, I don't know, I think that's the, the turning point for me is. Now, I, how would you then, uh, to all the, the women and, and men watching, um, what would then be your advice to others to find their, their passion? Because w would you then say it's basically up to coincidence and external factors until you come across something that you really feel very strongly about? Or can you really actively pursue a passion because in the in the end i guess everyone would like to find out what their passion Absolutely. is that's a good point sarah and let me say let me go back to my college here just a little bit when i went to college i went off on the track of doing something in radio but i found that i wasn't really it really wasn't where i was happy and what i told you that i come from a long line of educators and i had been a part of many tutoring and been to my, you know, I've, I've done a lot with education as a child because that's what my mom did, is what my great aunt did, is what my um, mother, I mean, like I just have all these people in my life that had done education. Well, when I was in college, I interned at a radio station, but I, it wasn't really what I ended up like doing. What I found myself doing was I call this the boomerang, all right? And you can mention a boomerang. I kept going back to education. So I kept finding, I would, what I found myself doing is anywhere on campus where there was an opportunity for me to work with kids or tutor or go volunteer at a school or do, I did a lot of tours. Like I became a tour guide at, I went to UNC Chapel Hill. And what, what began to put all those pieces together was I kept going back. I kept going back to education. Every time I tried to veer from it, something would bring me back to the heart of really what I was supposed to do and where my heart was, was, was working with children. And I can recall I was sitting, I was helping in an elementary school there in Chapel Hill. And I thought at, at that moment, I was still sort of struggling about what am I going to do? And this was early in my senior year of college. And I decided that I would go ahead and apply for my master's degree in education because I found myself just continually being excited and invigorated by being around a school. So what I would say when you're starting to think about what your passion is and how this works, the one thing is, is gaining self-awareness, understanding who you are and, and what do you go back to over and over and over again. When you sit down in Google or when you sit down and you're excited, when you get lost in something and you don't realize that you've just spent two hours doing X, Y, or Z, that's when you begin to find your passion. I when I sit down and I start thinking about, you know, a lesson or something that we're going to work with in the kids, I can get, you know, I go down these rabbit holes and these trains, finding all different kinds of activities and things that we can do with kids that it just lights me up. So that to me is the boomerang. Where do you go back to over? And, and as much as you throw it out there and, you know, you may think that's not what you need, you keep coming back. And probably it's something you have been doing or keep on doing, but you might not be aware of it. So I, I like your advice to kind of perhaps sit down and really become more self-aware, reflect a bit on, on when this happens, this, this boomerang effect. I like that. It's a, it's a very nice um, picture. Now, I wonder, you are confident and you turned your passion into a profession. It's like a job, basically. Mm -hmm. Is this then an equation, what you say, uh, to become confident? Uh, and successful, you always need to turn a passion into a job? No. I don't know that that's always, I mean, for me, that's what ended up happening. This is what I would say. We struggle often as females in the workforce to really find our voice and find where we stand. What I would say is, what I have learned over the years, and this just comes from experience, and, I'm, and I want to be very, very honest. This is, um, 
this talking about finding confidence and, and, and finding it with passion is what has really worked for me because as a child, I was very, very shy. I mean, painfully shy. I uh, did not really find my spot until I went into a theater class in the eighth grade and found uh, a way in which I could express my feelings without feeling like I was going to be picked on. I was in a safe place and I felt like I could step forth and really be my internal nerdy self because I am very, like I said, a nerd sometimes has a, a bad connotation to it, but I am academic. I am, I'm, I love, you know, all the things about learning and, and growing, but when you're thinking about confidence, where I found myself is when I could, when I could start, to, when I started talking about education, or I started talking about working with other kids and understanding my, I would get excited and I could feel my, my voice uh, having more strength in it. I could hear my voice having more um, conviction. And so instead of me trying to be something I wasn't, I had to find out who I was on the inside. So finding my values, finding my self-awareness and knowing that education is really where I thrive. I Teaching and everything around teaching and everything around working with students and growing is where I am. My unique area of expertise is, is where I, ke I kept saying, oh my gosh, this is so exciting and so interesting. And when I did that, then that's when I began to get confidence. I began to find my, my rhythm, my drum beat, because I knew in my heart that this was really what was so important to me. If you're working in an industry, it did, you know, what I call it are quick wins. When you walk in somewhere and you know that you have a really good knack for project management, or maybe a really good knack for digital design, or maybe you are really good at reading, you know, in terms of you've got good vocabulary and you can write really, really well. Those are your areas of expertise and you have a confidence in that and probably a passion because for me, writing is, you know, like I struggle with writing, but someone else does that really well and could say, hey, I could help you write X, Y, or Z. And then that begins to move your confidence up the ladder. Now, what I wonder, um, let's say you have um, reflected on yourself, you have become more self-aware, you know how you are really best, your best self, what your passion is, that's one thing. But then there's the society, right? It's the people around you that very often judge you. And particularly when you're younger, you're, you might not be able to deal with this judgment. And now I wonder, particularly coming back to technology, um, you know, you use the, the term geeky or nerdy very often as a girl. It's, it's still not sexy. It's not cool yeah. to, to do something on technology, which is very unfortunate due to how we have been raised, certain gender bias that are still out there. How do we make sure that in the future, um, girls do not let themselves kind of um, affect um, by such kind of the, the people surrounding them like I literally have one um, memory of my sister and um, she was telling me Sarah um, you know I, I, I w wanted to study computer science but I didn't do it because then everyone was telling me I wouldn't find a boyfriend and this was in the teenage years right so mm -hmm. it's like just this kind of thought and it's like wow this is crazy um, that a teenager a 14, 15 year old girl would think that, but and she is not the only one. So many girls, I think, um, don't follow their heart because they are afraid of how people surrounding them will assess them or will look yeah. at them. Yeah, I know. It's um, that breaks my heart for for her and you know and 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 for most of our girls. There's not really, there's not a quick answer for this. This is not something that is an easy, quick, let me give you the three point recipe that's going to fix this problem. What I do know is that we have to have better conversations about what is technology and begin to demystify what is computer science. 
ultimately right now when we think about what is computer science people automatically go to coding and sitting behind a computer like if i i ask some of my young people that just this past week about it and they were like oh yeah when we first heard what, that this was a computer science camp we thought we'd be sitting you know programming all day long well programming is a part of computer science and it's a big part of computer science but it's not the only and there's so many different areas that we can utilize to talk with females about and talk with others about how they can become a part of the field or leverage their particular area of expertise within the tech field. So I have a lot of conversations around, well, what is it that you like to do? You know, what do you love? You know, if it is writing, reading, fashion, um, digital arts, if it's art in general. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about what, so, let me use art as an example because this is an this is kind of an easy example to, to think about and we're, we've done a lot with it but um when you begin to think again about growing your confidence and finding your passion and understanding how that fits into the tech world art is a really really high complex discipline there is an extreme amount of science and math that goes into creating a piece of art if you even just sit down and think about cultivating a piece of abstract art, right? There is what we call computational thinking that goes involved in that. You've gotten computational thinking is where we decompose, pattern match, abstract, and then create an algorithm. We as humans do this naturally. And what we try to do as a computer scientist is take what we do naturally in our brain and put it in an order so that you can begin thinking about how a computer can do the same thing. Right. Hmm. So if you pr propose a problem to a computer, to a computer, like it's got to work through the code to figure out how to solve that problem or move through to be able to give back the kick back out the output that you want input output. So the same thing happens when you're thinking about a piece of art, you know, well, what if I say, Sarah, I'd like for you to make a piece of abstract art for me immediately your brain is already thinking through oh good gracious what is she saying oh my baby baby do what what color what colors what is abstract right you know, you're automatically already processing those pieces yeah. all right well then i'd say okay sarah i also would like it to be 12 by 12. i would like to have five triangles and seven angles and i want the colors red blue and green and then i'd like for the secondary colors to be you know whatever all of that began you began to have to process those pieces that art of thinking is the exact same thing you're going to do if someone asks you to create a piece of digital art on a computer so if you're really good at creating something physically you can take that skill set that confidence in that skill set and be able to transfer it to learning how to use an online program like adobe photoshop or something else to cultivate the same piece or we could even take that same piece and i can teach you how to code that abstract piece of art because once you understand the mathematical skills or understanding how to create this um, piece physically we can take any of that and put it on to technology and so i are think you that's the piece. basically saying it's just about paraphrasing or kind of describing technology differently what it really means and what it is in practice and then you can basically attract the interest of, of girls more easily. Yes. I would, as a counter story, tell you the following. So I, I read about a story, I think it was from the University of Berkeley, and they had a course on IT. And before there were really hardly any female students enrolling. But then, as a test, the university changed the name of the course. And I think they call it something like the beauty of um, creating beauty. something. So beauty, beauty. like the word technology, IT was no longer yep. in it. Mm -hmm. And now actually, apparently, there are more female students enrolling. That would kind of, is that a bit what you're saying? I was a part of that um, study. <laughs> yeah, sir, it's, uh, mm -hmm. Study with you later. It's really interesting, yeah. Well, here's the thing. You know, there's, again, as I said to you, it's not an easy answer. There's not an easy, because we've had a long history. And, and, and let's, not, let's not devalue the fact of where we've come. You know I mean? what has been developed and what we've created in terms in the in the IT world. I mean, it was clunky. It was big. There was some pieces that, you know, I mean, I don't know that I would have hopped on having to plug things in and be in a giant room with a 
the first IBM computer. You know, I don't, as females, you know, we have a, an art to who we are and what we love and what we represent. And if we, we like to take, you know, we like the caring, the developing, the project management, we like those pieces, right? And that's, let's honor that taking and now the thing is is that tech has developed so quickly over the past 10 years that there's a lot more opportunities for us to be in this field and to really elevate it with our skill set so in addition to being a programmer and programming the next great app or software or video game or website in addition we also can bring to the table really great conversations around visual the experience because as as females we tend to uh, adopt technology first so what is that experience what is that marketing and the key to this and this is what i've said from the very beginning and and this is really where i found my niche um i am not a app developer or a software developer i'm not it's actually a part of me that i don't particularly enjoy in terms of um computer science where I found my love was in data. So data is really what drives everything we do, period, in business. But it's a huge component of computer science. Anything that's machine learning, artificial intelligence, website, all of that's driven by the numbers. Who's using, what's using, um, how are we using data to teach the computer to do something? So for me, where I found my love was in analytics and using programming to find out information. And I was told for a long time that I wasn't very good at math, but I'm very good at math, by the way. Um, I just had to find where I found my passion. So I'm blabbering a little bit, but my point is, is that for, for young ladies that you know are really, really good at math or really, really good at science, they can find their spot in the world of tech just based on what they really like to do. Now I wonder, and actually before I say that to, to tell the people on the line, we have 10 more minutes left. If there are any questions, please don't hesitate, write them down and we will respond to them. Um, I wonder you were just saying, uh, people said you were not good at math. Uh, this is something as a girl I would hear often during high school. Now I wonder, you teaching girls, I assume you would never ever say something like this. Um, how do you um, empower the students in your classes, the girls? How do you how do you make them realize that these kind of phrases like "you're not good at math" are absolute um, um, nonsense? Um, and that is, because I mean, how do you tell that a little girl or a teenager? Because they very often will probably embrace this and keep that in mind. Oh yeah, I'm not good at math, so I won't even try. So do you have any? confident formula so to say that you that helps you to to encourage and empower these young young girls and women well two things uh, well there's several things but one thing is I, I practice what i preach so i myself don't know everything so i often tell them all the time like uh when we're doing any of it i ask for their help on almost everything like i need y'all to help guide this old lady um, I'll say that a lot, but um, how one thing we do is if they if that comes out of their mouth and it does often that's it's an interesting question or concept we've gotten to um, I, I very defined piece. I had a camp um, where I had some like eight to 11 year olds in camp and we did all kinds of mathematical equations and concepts and creating art and things like that. The next week I had fashion camp and we were going to be using tech to design fashion. The first thing that came out of one of the young ladies mouth and she was 12 was I'm not good at math. And I hmm. said, oh, no, 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 no. We're gonna reframe that conversation. You are excellent at math. We just have to figure out the right way to apply it. So a couple of things. One is I often tell them we have to reframe failure. We have to think about failing differently. Here's the truth of it. No matter anything that you have ever learned in your life, and I know for kids, sometimes they forget because when they're younger, they don't, they're learning all the time, right? As we get older, we, we think we've got to have everything right the first time. And in particular, in this particular uh, time in our culture where so much is instant gratification and having to know and move forward. But 
I tell them, you are not going to get this the first time. It is likely that you're gonna to have to do it two, three, four times, but by the fifth, sixth or seventh time of us trying, we're gonna get this. And I, I, so that reframing of what does it mean to fail and how do we do that to improve the next time? If we start, we do a lot with um, data analysis in my camp. So, I mean, in particular in fashion, we run a lot of numbers around what, what is selling, what is not selling, how many people have clicked on a website, what is the algorithm that keeps, uh, that moves you up in the, in the feed. And the first couple of times we did it, they were like, oh, 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 you know, they're just, so just, we're going to try it again. You know, um, yesterday I was teaching web development and I had two nine-year-olds and they literally were like ping pong balls. And finally, when I got them to, you know, like, all right, we're going to try it one more time. And that last time they were able to code it correctly. But to say that, and the way that I encourage them is one, We've got to reframe failure. We have to think about it in a different way. You have to fail forward. You're going to make mistakes. It's okay to make mistakes. In my particular camps and workshops, it's safe. It's safe to not get it right. It's safe to have the conversation that you don't understand, but only with the, press, with the um, perception that you're going to keep trying. And the other thing that I tell them is that we have to embrace some uncertainty. Whenever we're learning something new, as much as we want to have everything planned out. And believe me, this is hard for me to say because I am not good with change, oddly. Um, we have to embrace the fact that the only thing that is certain is change. And just like everything that's happened with COVID, we have to figure out a way to use that computational thinking skill set to pivot and move and rethink. So when you mentioned earlier that I was an out-of-the-box thinker, it really that, that warmed my heart a lot because that's what I have always sort of prided my career on is finding different ways to solve problems. And that's what I have worked to instill in my young ladies that come through our program or any of the women that I've taught. How do we solve it differently? Now, perhaps at last, I would also be keen to know, um, do you think there's only a need to educate these girls and help them develop confidence? Do you think boys at this age, oh. um, they, they have the confidence already? I mean, there are studies, of course, that do prove that um, the confidence level of, of girls continues to be lower than that of boys and men until basically the, the early 40s. Um, but do you, do you develop, see any changes also in the behavior of boys? Do you, oh. do you feel like something should also be done to, to influence their behavior? Oh, yes. I actually have two sons of my own. Um, <clears throat> they are nine and six. And my son attended the camp with me last week as the only boy in, in the camp. Um, and wow. uh, he had all, you know, his, his closest friends are, are girls. Um, I know we don't have much time left and I could talk for days and days and days about this, but yes, young boys have to have confidence too. They also have to understand that in terms of gender equity, that they must respect the other gender as well. Um, what, however that gender identifies as female or male, you know, whatever that works for that individual. And that it is truly about collaboration. We are better together. Female brains and male brains work differently. I mean, that's proven in science. It's been proven for years and years and years. But together, it creates this wonderful whole. And what I tell my girls, the reason why I have focused a lot on, on females in my programming is because middle school, and I focused on mostly on middle school girls, is just a very strange time hormonally. And there's a lot of discovery and you're uncomfortable. There's just so many things. And having the same gender together helps them begin to build some confidence and find their passion. And then that helps drive them further along as they move through into their careers. With the boys, what I tend to do is I tend to keep the, the girls together in middle school. And then for the younger kids, I'll incorporate a lot of boys and girls together because there's not as much hormonal situation there. That middle school area, I keep them together. And then by the time they hit high school, I'll bring them back together again. You know, just kind of, that's a little, couple year hump there that I separate them out. But yes, 
we have to empower the boys too. And we have to empower them to understand equity and collaboration as a part of their work. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic that you start so early because um, actually I read the other day that the confidence of girls peaks at the age of nine already. So mm -hmm. I guess if we start very early, we can make sure or prevent certain certain yeah attitude that or a kind of thought process and pattern that, that women, young women often display. Um, now, Sharon, just let you know, there was one comment. Thank you for your inspiring thoughts. I wish I had you as my teacher. I can only oh. respect that. Um, I'd, love, I'd love to, but perhaps you can change that. I, I should uh, participate in one of your workshops at some point. Now, well, you we all still can, Miss Sarah. You guys can call in <laughs> and be guest speakers 100% to either my girls or the teachers that I work with. Um, your story is inspirational and how you have been able to find your own confidence and how you found your, you navigated. You know what I mean? For me, I found it through going back to what I loved, you know, and I know that you did the same. You just did it in a different track than I did. You know, I mean, corporate is a very different beast than education. Education has, um, they're just, it, it's two different, very different tracks in, in how you move down. And in education, you know, there, it's a, you're either a teacher, administrator, or, you know, or working in the central office. And, and so that's the other piece that I also want to say is that there's lots of different ways to still be in education, but not, and inspire, just not necessarily, you don't have to be in the classroom. You can do, I guess what I'm doing, but <laughs> do anything you want to. Exactly. There are many, many different ways and there's not one size fits all method to find your confidence. So let me perhaps try to kind of summarize what we talked about in the last 40 minutes. So we we started out with passion and, and I was kind of claiming you seem to be confident, you are confident. Is it somehow related to your to your passion? Because you know what you're strong at, what you're really good at, what you're very passionate about. So you kind of shared your path of how you found your passion and you were kind of describing that there are different ways and in any event it might might take time and we shouldn't expect to find our passion within a year or two if once we suddenly start looking for it and i love this kind of idea of this boomerang effect that very often you actually know what your passion is yeah. really what you have to do is sit down and become self-aware of your kind of your feelings what you feel strongly about you described that something always pulled you back to education and I guess in the end, it, it boils down also to, to intuition, right? What you, what you really, what, yeah, your, your body and your, your mind and, uh, tells you in the end. Mm -hmm. um, then you also said you, you should learn to listen to your own values, to, to, to yourself, um, rather than listening to the voices around you, which I guess is difficult, particularly when you're, when you're younger. Um, mm -hmm. But... By collaborating, um, you were saying, for example, um, having boys and girls together, but also just having kind of girls groups and, and working on things together and asking for help by being vulnerable and, and sharing your thoughts, um, you might learn to, to become um, more authentic by just um, being yourself and having the courage to be yourself. And then you, I also really like you were saying, um, reframe the conversation around failure. Don't see it as something negative, but as something that is part of the your journey, right? Uh, there are no quick wins, um, but the journey is ne um, a failure is necessary to to come to the win in in the end. And um, and and you were also uh, referring to COVID as for change. In the end, we also we all, we, are, we can never anticipate and foresee the future. Um, things can change, also unforeseeably, like now with COVID. So. We need to, to be able to to reframe perhaps also our ideas, our goals, and just be be flexible. I wonder if there is there something I missed or anything you would like to add to this quick summary that I tried to present here? You did an amazing job. And um, again, why I really enjoy working with you. You're so good at the putting all this, all that blabbering that I did into a, a good, uh, concise uh, piece. Uh, no, I, I would say this, and, and, and I want, 
you and I have had this conversation before, and um, I, I want the rest of you all to understand that I've had this wonderful opportunity to talk to Sarah, and part of the reason why I continue to gain um, my confidence is because I have women like Sarah that we can have a conversation with, and we can talk about celebrating each other and empowering one another to tell our story, to hear our voice, and understand that this didn't happen overnight for me. I mean, I have spent years of struggling to figure out my place of where where am i supposed to be and the only thing that i found that would always bring me solace or success is when i went back inside and knew and went back to what i felt was who i am right here and that and i'm in my heart and that was making sure i was true to who i was making sure i was true to who my values are and my values have always been faith family and fellowship and that has come from my grandparents and my parents and as long as i could drive that the rest of it began to fall in place and i think that that's my ultimate message is that when we believe in what we love and who we are the rest of it just begins to happen and i still learn every day you know so much of of my journey is still to come um, I have grown tremendously over these past uh, 10 years or so. My 30s were quite a year, decade of change of marriage, family, you know, marriage, children, job changes, et cetera. I'm excited. I just turned 40. So 40, I think, is going to be a marvelous decade. But the other thing that I want you to think about, too, is when you do find your passion and you find where you feel like you're going to be successful, know that the road is not always going to be easy. And my mom gave me the best advice that I've ever had um, in my life, and I'd share this with Sarah, too. Um, and it, she always said, give yourself a year. When you make a change and you decide that this is gonna happen, you have, and it could be anything. You get married, you have a baby, you change jobs, you open something, you start something new. Give yourself a year to figure out the ins and outs of how that's going to work. And somehow, she's always right, <laughs> that when I hit the darkest of my darks, that I think to myself, okay, Give myself a year, give myself time to accept the change, to learn from the change and know that that's gonna move me forward. It's not gonna be perfect. And in between, you may have a quick win or two where you're able to do some things that really keeps you moving. But somehow within that year, you begin to find your rhythm and, and all the things begin to fall into place. So that's, that's so really much. Yeah. Thanks so much for these final beautiful words and I can only resonate with what you just said. Uh, I really love it. I've, I've moved like half a year ago to Beijing, not knowing anyone, not speaking the language, not knowing the people and culture. And um, I guess one could easily give up on the way, but it's true. You need to give yourself time. And it's true, the longer I stay, the more I realize, oh yes, it just takes time. And I, I guess we are just too impatient nowadays. <laughs> We, we are, and we don't think it's that's the thing. And we're, we live in a world of instant gratification. I see it with my children all the time. Even, you know, even us, like we think, oh, we can't find it on this Google or find the answer immediately that, you know, whatever. And I've had to go back and think to myself again, okay, give, give a little bit of time, Sharon. We're still human. We still have to process everything, even with all the technology going around and we use it to, for our betterment. We still have to give ourselves time to accept and to and to use that to grow i mean that's Wonderful. just that, that's the truth now i would like to end the session with um, a comment from a local fan <laughs> i love it so there's elizabeth the red child it is so lucky to have you living your passion and helping to inspire our future leaders so, oh, thank you so I really much. that, Sharon. Thanks so much for having taken the time to speak to us. Oh my and, gosh, thank um, you. <laughs> and you should read afterwards the comments, Sharon. There are many more uh, compliments. Um, 
yeah, we will we will upload this video also on um, on our website and on social okay. media. So if you want to share it afterwards and make sure that more people get inspired and develop the confidence that they are seeking, please go ahead. And also, of course, we will share afterwards all the further information about Sharon, about her organization, and about her podcast, etc. In um, kind of in the link below. Oh yes, so thanks, Sarah, Sarah will be a guest with me in a couple of weeks too. So let oh, me yes. say that. Sarah oh, yes. and are going to be joining me for my radio. I have a radio show called Coding the Future, and Sarah um, and uh, Kate are going to be on there talking about Unleash today and all of their work <laughs> they're doing internationally to move this movement. And I'm just honored to be a part of it. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much so to everybody. Thank you so much for my comments. <laughs> Um, this has been wonderful, and to Miss Elizabeth, who uh, Austin, who has been a huge supporter of our work here in Charlotte, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You have kept me going um, when I needed it, so thank you. Perfect. Wonderful. Then I'm I'm going to bed soon, and I wish you now a great start into the day, Sharon. Too. And a great end to your day, <laughs> and the middle of the day for the, for all of our people in uh, the London area. Oh, yes, that's very true. Have a fantastic day, everyone. And thanks for joining. Bye.